my name is Arun Machundar. I'm from Google and um, also Stanford and formerly at RPE. And since the last two speakers are from RPE, are, Mariana, are we to assume that we're supposed to lead the dancing? Yeah. <laughs> Good Lord. Let's get, to, let's get to Heathrow, Cheryl. Let's get the heck out of here. But um, you know, I'm, a, I'm probably a minority in this crowd. I'm a scientist and an engineer, sort of in the trenches of technology innovation. And literally, we are in the home of the Industrial Revolution. And just a few observations that I would make from my background as to how innovations work. For example, if you look at this phone and what innovations have gone into it, and I hope you all use Android phone, by the way. Uh, but you know, this goes back 50 years ago. The transistor, integrated circuits, laser optic and fiber optic communication, wireless communication, Unix operating system, all of that was 50 years of research. And if you look back and some lessons learned here, some basic lessons, basic and applied research cannot be separated. The laws of thermodynamics that give you the efficiency of engines, James Watt engine, were developed 100 years after Watt created the steam engine. So the science came much later than the basic science, than the application. Both basic and applied research takes time to mature. Just give you an example. The first paper on the concept of the internet was published in 1974. The first ARPANET was launched in 1983, nine years later. And it took a decade more of investing in research for the ARPANET, or now the internet, to be really created as we know it. So 20 years, R&D is not a straight line. If you think it is a straight line, let me give you one example. The original design of the transistor, which is a point contact transistor made of germanium, no one uses today. The, in, the field effect transistor and the use of silicon came much later. So if anyone says that this R&D is going to produce that economic growth, I think should have some humility because you cannot predict what's going to happen. And number four, failure is very important. Research is a risky business. And if you don't fail, we'll never learn. In fact, the learning, when something violates the conventional wisdom, and that you learn is your competitive advantage. So these are some basic lessons learned from science and engineering from the history. And I think it's really important when we talk about financing to understand how research really works. And in terms of technology, I would just say that you know, what should the private sector invest? What should the government invest in? There are two types of technologies. One is an existing technology that needs to be improved. You need research to do that too. Moore's law, or integrated circuits. You need research to make it better and better, cheaper and faster, etc. And that is an existing techno-economic learning curve, and it goes to the bottom line of Intel and other companies, and the private sector needs to invest in that because they get the benefit of the bottom line. But think about the internet. When the internet was being proposed, there was no industry. So what about market-driven thing? There is no market. So that's where the government needs to step in. And someone said, I think, unknown. Yes, that is the unknown in terms of research. And it is, there's an unpredictability. If you ask Bob Kahn and Vince Cerf in 1974, did they think the internet is going to be like this today, email and everything else? They had no idea. So there is a, there's the aspect of letting it go, let it network and figure out. That's very, very important. And there's the private sector, because there's no market, will never invest. The government has to step in. So let me stop here. Thank you very much.